Oh. Ooh. This week on Kentucky Afield. Ooh, he's the right color. There you go. Colder weather and some of the best fishing of the year are just around the corner. So you might not want to put those rods up just yet. There we go. Next. We'll tell you the unusual story of how brook trout ended up in the Red River Gorge. Then, we get the dogs out. We're chasing quail on Peabody WMA. It's all next on Kentucky Afield. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plumb loaded with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> Yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> first Saint Leo. Yeah, look at it. It's a keeper. Here it goes. Yeah. Boom! Oh. Oh. Wow, that happened fast. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Afield. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. Deer and rabbit season may be in here in Kentucky, but for those diehard fishermen, they'll tell you fishing season has not ended. As a matter of fact, the best time of year has just begun. Oh, what a beautiful day. Now this is a it's a fantastic lake to catch, you know, good, good size smallmouth and trophy smallmouth. Obviously, the world record from here, but this lake gets a lot of pressure now. Yeah. To, to come yeah. here and try to catch a eight or nine, ten pounder. I mean, that's a fish yeah. of a lifetime. I fish this lake a lot and I've never, I've never broken uh, eight pounds. And I don't know if yeah. I've had a seven pounder, but the lake is is fishing really, really, really good right now. Yes. So hopefully, I'm going to try to throw some swim baits, some jigs, maybe some blade baits. But I'm going to start throwing a swim bait and uh, see if we can't catch some fish. What do you think? Uh, we can do it. Let's go. All right. I will tell you, this time of year, our water temperature is 46 degrees. It's all about a real slow presentation. And a lot of times, when we catch fish down here this time of year, the bites are not aggressive. It doesn't feel like you're catching a four pound fish when you first get a bite. It's, really? It feels like you're getting a bluegill just pecking it. And you're like, man, these little fish are driving me nuts. Well, they're not little fish. <laughs> yeah. They're, okay. they're big fish. There we go. There you go. Now, you want to establish a food source? Check this out. How about that? Now you think they're actively feeding? Their mouth is plumb full of <laughs> shad. Shad, how about that? We got about an 18 inch fish there. We've been here five minutes. We now know they're feeding yeah. on shad actively and we're sitting in between 35 and 40 feet of water and we're catching fish in 15 to 18 feet. So hey, now we're on to something. <laughs> we just run around and do this all day. <laughs> you need a net? I don't think he's that big. Sometimes they get bigger when they get to the boat, though. Not a bad fish. He's a lot fatter than the last one. That's a healthy fish there. Yeah. That's a thicker fish than the last one. Yeah. Probably about the same length. You know, we're looking at that 18, 19 inch fish. 18 and a little bit. You would expect a fish that size when it hits your bait to just about pull your paw out of your hand. Yep. That was this. Ju that was it. Ju June, they will. 2.30 two in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> he absolutely will. It'll get a little bigger. So when you first started fishing down here, how often did you guys throw soft plastics? We was throwing mostly a spinner bait. I fished with uh, Ernie Taylor. He guided down here quite a bit. And when we first started fishing down here, we would find the grass and get out at right at the very end of it. 25, 28 foot deep, and then we went to different times jig or, or the plastic. We got a rod bender. Yeah, he was way out here. Oh, 
I didn't get that little brownie. I, I believe I found one of them old large men. Oh, sure did. How did you do that? Very carefully. <laughs> Typically, for me, it's about one large mouth for every 20 small mouth, but. Well, you wouldn't leave me no small mouth, so I just had to catch a <laughs> large mouth. Next. <laughs> hey, we need your brown cousin. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty healthy fish, though. Turn it loose. I'm gonna get this 10 pounder out here. All right. Well, oh, there, there you go. Goes. You might want to grab the net on this one, Daryl, if you don't mind. How can you believe that? So I cast it up in here, and there's a lot of rock that's uh, pretty easy to get hung on. Hooked on that rock, was shaking that off, and got on the backside, and when I snapped it free, I thought Daryl would hook my line, because I felt it make that motion. Went ahead and set the hook, <laughs> and uh, that's what hit it. 20 and a little more than a half. Almost, nice. Nice. almost 21 inches. Nice. That's a really good fish right there. Get that one back in the water. Yep. What I'm throwing here is just this little, uh, it's a 3 8 ounce tungsten lure. I'm throwing this little swim bait here. I'm throwing this exposed. Run this bait on there. And these, uh, these swing impact fats have a little area where you bring your hook up through. What this thing does is it goes down and it sets and when I start to pull it, it comes up like this. And very little motion will get that tail making this move. And then I'll pull it across the bottom, I'll stand it back up. The reason it doesn't feel like a big strike is because those fish, it's catching their attention, and they're just picking it up. And when they pick it up, you'll just feel something very, very slight. If you're not using a really sensitive rod, and fluorocarbon line, you may not feel it at all. You'll just all of a sudden notice there's no bait. When that happens, then you've had a strike. Uh oh. Ooh. Need a net? No, I don't know. I don't know what I need. I don't know what, hey, it's a little oh, yeah. light. It's the right color. A 10 pound test line, you might. He's, he's the right color. There you go. Yeah, he's out here deep. He's out here up pulling real, so boy, look how light colored he is. Now I'll tell you, we've ran all over the lake today, and we pulled back in, we can literally see the boat ramp, fishing some grass, and, and here they here they sit. They're right here beside us. That's a nice fish though. Yeah. Like I say, and you and you see that this time of year, you start to see yeah. them when they come up. You'll see some that are really colored up, and then you'll get a really pale colored fish like this. And these are yeah. fish that have been in deep, deep dark, water, cold water, coming up. And they're just coming up. Thank you there, the little fish. He was ready to get going. You gotta find the lounge to where they're at at the airport. <laughs> gotta find the food bar. I'm pretty good at finding it. <laughs> oh, missed him. Just got polarized. Oh, came back and hit it, get ready. Look at that. That's when they're starting to get more aggressive right there. When you swing on one and miss, and he comes running back and hits it again, that's when you know they're starting to get aggressive. Daryl, this might be a pretty good fish. Whoa! Grab that net there if you don't mind. Oh, I just happened to have it this time. Yeah, this old boy ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Thank you. That is a nice one there. Now this one here. That's the best one of the day. This one here has got some girth to it. Not that terribly long, but look how thick and healthy this smallmouth here is. 20 and a quarter. Four pounds, eight ounces. All right. That's a beauty. That right there is the reason you come to Del Hollow. Catch a big fish like that. Thank you, buddy. Away he goes. The Red River Gorge in Eastern Kentucky is an amazing place, but the story of brook trout in Parched Corn Creek, well, it's spectacular as well. So Tom, we're down here in Red River Gorge. Tell me what we're doing today. We're getting ready to stock some brook trout here in Parched Corn Creek today. And this is an ongoing study, right? Yeah, this is the last year of a five-year project that we started, and from here, we're gonna see how the fish do.
This whole idea of putting brook trout in parched corn creek came from a gentleman from Louisville back in the 50s, right? Right, so a crazy story. This gentleman lived in Louisville, had ties to Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and wanted to reintroduce this fish to his area. So he did tons and tons and tons of research about different streams around the area, mm -hmm. found some that were actually suitable habitat for brook trout, which are very finicky in their habitat, trucked them down from Pennsylvania, and then reintroduced them in these remote streams in eastern Kentucky. This guy was not a fisheries biologist. Right. Should have been. <laughs> he missed his calling. Right? Absolutely. Bill Holmes, I think, was his name. And Bill would pick these trout up and created an aerator and a way to keep the water cool in a backseat of a car and brought them down here and released them. Right. And did it for years. Yes. It's not a really easy thing to do. Is it? Well, raising fish in general isn't an easy thing to do. That's step one. Then he did step two, found a suitable place to stock them, which is something that we spend our whole working career trying to figure out. And I was reading that he had actually traveled all through the Appalachian Mountains and had found two waterways in the state of Kentucky that he thought would be suitable for brook trout. Right. One here, and the other one I think if it was in Bell or Letcher County or something. Mm -hmm. so yep. Imagine in the 50s, before the highway systems, before <laughs> GPS, and navigating this terrain and taking data, water temperature, water clarity, and to try to find two suitable streams. Yep. Fast forward now, 2013, we start as an agency putting these back in. It's an amazing story. It is an amazing story, absolutely. So we're bagging up these fish, basically putting in about 15 to 18 brook trout, and then putting in oxygen, and then banding them so the water doesn't come out, and then loading them in backpacks to be carried down to the stream. Hey guys, we've arrived. We're going to head downstream dumping bags in each individual hole. The riffles will be only a few inches deep. We're not too far from the head of the stream itself. You were telling me that predominantly these trout species are going to live on insects. What type of insects can be found in this area that are good forage for trout? Well, pretty much anything that falls off the canopy itself will drop in. There's probably some hatches of mayflies and stoneflies. Okay. And that'll give them some kind of food source. Brook trout will eventually get big enough to eat other fish species, but they don't prefer it, right? Right, yep. Yeah, they're primary insectivores. They will switch over if there's a wounded fish, something like that in front of them, then they'll eat that for sure, but primarily insectivores. Okay, cool. So this is one of the sites that we'll probably stock. What makes this kind of a good site is the deeper pool, the woody habitat that's here at the end of it, and also the heavy riffle coming in to add oxygen to the water that's already there. So we can go ahead and dump a bag here. If somebody wants to dump their bag here, you got two in there? Yeah, if you want to dump one bag in here. So because we're close to the head, this water is coming out of the ground, the range of temperatures is probably fairly minimal. This is never going to freeze solid, right? No. The water coming out of the ground is 50-something degrees. So typically, the highest it gets in the entire summer is high 60s, right? Yes. You yep. hope. Yes, hopefully so. Because if it gets over that, then... Then these fish aren't able to make it. The Department of Fish and Wildlife stocks trout all over the state, but it really is a situation where we're putting trout into fins lakes or areas where we know that the trout are not going to live throughout the summertime. Yes. We put them in and allow people to catch them. They harvest them and they take them. And this situation is a little different. This is a situation where we do hope that there are some reproduction and there is no take. If you catch one of these brook trout, it has to immediately be released. Yes, absolutely. So we want them released as gentle as possible so that they are able to live further and reproduce in the years to come. Look at that, beautiful little fish. They're ready to go. Some of them want to stay in the bag. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
it's a very unique situation. Where else can you go in the state of Kentucky and catch brook trout? Cumberland Tailwaters, I guess, has brook trout, but nothing like this where you're walking into a stream half a mile to three quarters of a mile in with this beautiful scenery and fishing for brook trout that we're going to coin as wild if they reproduce by themselves. Yeah, absolutely. That's the only other place I've ever been in the state of Kentucky where I've caught brook trout, and that's the Cumberland River. And we're looking at a creek here. I think I could jump across most of it. Definitely, yep. Yeah. This would pose a much bigger challenge to catch a fish, I would think. As clear as this water is, fish are going to see you. They are. Most people will sneak up from them from downstream and try and cast at them as far away as they can in order to not spook them out of the holes that they're already in. It's about the opportunity to catch one, not about catching the biggest trout of all time. Because you're not going to come here and do that, right? No. So what's a really good one here? Nine inches, eight inches? Really, yeah, absolutely. I mean, really that's good a really, one. really good fish. Yes, yeah, so we're stocking them in at about five inches. Their life expectancy in here is probably about three to five years. So hopefully in that time, they'll make it to eight or nine inches and be able to be harvested then. It's about passion. It really is driven by people that want to get out and experience something very unique. It is, yep. Fantastic. Well, let's get these fish in here. Well, that's it. Those things are fast. They head for cover, huh? They do. They go to this deep water woody debris and just hang out in there. You bump the debris and they'll come out for just a second and dart to the next spot. Well, that was our last bag of the day, and this is the last stocking. You just put the last few trout in parched corn creek. We did, yeah. Hopefully the spawning will take off and they'll be able to keep themselves sustained is the hope in the long run. This turned out to be a pretty good story. The department decided to do a five-year plan, but taking a non-native species and moving in and putting it in a stream can be disastrous. Not only can it be disastrous, highly illegal as well. It is. One of the reasons we're doing this five-year study is to test reproduction, and you have shocked up some fish that have actually spawned in this creek. Yep, we call them young of year or yois. They were small, they were about two inches long. All I can say is good luck, brook trout, and thank you for all your time and energy. Yep, thank you. Let's get up out of here, what do you think? Let's go. The Peabody Wildlife Management Area in Western Kentucky has tons of hunting and fishing opportunities, including quail. This is Swale. He's two years old. He's got the potential to be a pretty good dog. Pretty dog. He is a beautiful dog, I, I agree. He wins the beauty contest. I don't know about the bird finding contest. <laughs> So are you seeing some improvements in the number of birds out yeah, here? Yeah, the last three years, the birds have come back a little bit better every year, I think. That's good. It's been a little tough early this season because of the weather, it's been so hot. One good thing, you can come out here, there, there is a lot of area, a lot of opportunity. Yes, there is. This is a place you can come, hunt public land, and have a realistic chance of getting bird contacts. But it's a great opportunity, you've got 46,000 acres, and it's a great place to come out and work, work dogs and, uh, and you know, obviously get some hunting in as well. Yep. On top of this hill right up right in front of us here we moved two cubbies of birds last friday they say the quail need three different type of habitats to really survive and uh, you know you need the fringe stuff that's kind of grown up which we obviously see quite a bit of that you got the timber and then you've got the fields to kind of feed, to in. feed in yeah this is really a little too thin right here to hold birds yeah and these birds down here they like a little overhead cover with a little tree cover something over their head that's where you'll find them at So when you got in that bird hunt, and I guess that first first couple cubbies come up in front of you, you was hooked, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, just watching the dogs work. <laughs> I can remember the very first time I ever had a covey of quail flush in front of me. I was actually rabbit hunting with my dad in Hart County, Kentucky. We went come over this ridge, and it was pretty thick, and we flushed a covey of quail. And I never even shouldered a gun because I had scared to death. I didn't even know. I think I was about 12 or 13. I just had reached the age where dad let me carry a shotgun. Most bird bait. Let's see what happens. <laughs> just that quick. That's just how it happens. They know where the cover's at and they love it. So they put this here out and then allow everything to grow over it and it just kind of keeps them out and gives the birds the area to run around yeah, underneath. Yeah, birds, right? rabbit, yeah. They did have brush over top of it, but it's all gone now. Have you seen that to be pretty effective? Uh, I can't say that I ever found birds around, but I'm sure they used it. Yeah. I'm sure the rabbits used it. 
These dogs would not rather be doing anything else than this right here, would they? They start whining as soon as they see the light come on in the kitchen. <laughs> tell everybody that comes down here there's there's quail and there's peabody quail and there's a the difference <laughs> these birds down here got a phd in dog avoidance <laughs> now peabody is open to, to anyone who's got a hunting license now there is a access there a peabody access permit yes there's a 15 dollars a year uh, permit well that's not only for hunting and fishing but even to use the area if you're riding horses or whatever you're doing you have to have that $15 permit. And then on top of that, if you're doing the type of hunting we're doing today, if you're rabbit hunting or quail hunting, you do need to check in and check out, correct? Only quail hunting. Quail hunting, okay. Yeah, they did a study, the study's over, but they're still tracking birds that they're taking and, and, and what they're finding. Essentially, they can figure out what the what the pressure and how many, how many hours it takes to hunt to get a yes. bird. There he is, that the birds eat the seeds. Birds come in, land on the wire, seeds come out and you get natural brush. Don't like it's been around long or it's not working. I think they just put it in this summer. Okay. I got a lady on point. Right here. I believe you got that bird, didn't you? That bird go down? I got it marked before the last time I saw the bird. I want to keep, a, keep an eye on that. That went right there. I bet that was it. Well, Jeff, it was a lot of fun. We got a lot of exercise. Yeah. That's part, that is part of bird hunting. And the dogs did great. We, uh, we did see four birds. Didn't get to bag a bird, but that's okay. It, you know what, it leaves more birds for another day. Yes, it does, yes, it does. I was happy we got to see a few birds anyway. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's all about your relationship with the dogs and just had a great time. We'll be back. Okay. These birds we'll haven't won just yet. We'll be happy to have you back <laughs> anytime. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Check out this beautiful sunset as David Waters shows us his nice little bluegill caught at Lake Cumberland. Good job. Here we have Frank Sheely of Cox's Creek, Kentucky, who caught this nice seven pound largemouth bass while fishing in Florida. Nice job. Here we have Bentley Critchelow with his first ever catch, a one pound, one ounce largemouth bass caught at the family farm pond. Nice job. Here we have Brad Trailer, who's fishing in his neighborhood farm pond in Boone County. He caught this largemouth bass while fishing with a fly rod. Congratulations. Here we have 13 year old Trey Cranfield, who caught this nice largemouth bass while fishing in a private pond in Oldham County. Nice job. Looks like the fish were really biting this day on Fort Knox as Tiffany Wade shows us her nice catfish while her dad in the background is reeling one in. Now here's a really nice largemouth bass caught by Brent in Oldham County. He caught this bass while night fishing in his Uncle Rick's farm pond. Nice job. Here we have a nice doe taken by David E. Jones Jr. And this deer was taken in Hardin County, Kentucky. Nice job. Check out how wide this buck is taken by Barry Smith. This buck was taken in Marion County in 2017. Man, nice job. Here we have a nice largemouth bass caught by Kyle Purdom in Marion County. This fish was caught in his great uncle Bobby's pond. Nice job. Bryson Snyder has good reason to smile. He's six years old and he's harvested his first turkey in Jefferson County, Kentucky. Congratulations. Here we have Travis Earlywine with a nice largemouth bass caught in Bourbon County in a farm pond. Nice job. Here we have Reed and his brother Cade Wagner who are catching catfish on the beach in Destin, Florida. Nice job. Here we have a nice buck that was taken by a crossbow by Shea McGuire of Paducah, Kentucky. This deer was taken in McCracken County. Nice job. Do you have a hunting or a fishing photo that you'd like to share? Well, Kentucky Field is now accepting emailed photos of the ones that didn't get away. We will no longer accept photos sent through the mail. Email your photo to us at kyfield.ones at ky.gov. Kentucky Field will be off air for the next two weeks as KET has special programming. But make sure you join us on December the 8th and we'll be back. And everyone have a happy Thanksgiving. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next time, I'm your host Chad Miles and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.
More Kentucky Afield is available at your fingertips. Whether by smartphone or desktop, you'll find extra tips, photos, even behind the scenes video on our social media pages. Join the conversation and stay in the woods or on the water longer when you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Simply search Kentucky Afield on your favorite app. Deer processing from the field to the freezer continues to be a runaway favorite for hunters everywhere. From ribs to roast, Sim Harp makes it look easy. Ordering information can be found at fw.ky.gov under the Kentucky Field tab. 